Okay, Martha Nussbaum, one of the most eminent living philosophers. Um, we're looking at a slice of her book, Sex and Justice. Rather a nice title, I guess, for a simple title. Uh, has a certain provocativeness. Um, and the slice we're getting of that uh, quite excellent book is uh, her defense of classical liberalism against uh, feminist critiques. We've seen a version of that in Held's, Virginia Held's uh, criticisms of social contract theory. Um, and social contract theory and classical liberalism are uh, connected historically and connected conceptually in certain ways. I think uh, probably maybe some version of classical liberalism might follow from social contract theory. Locke tries to show that it does. Um, I think Hobbes is wrong uh, to think that it doesn't really. Uh, that is because people forming a social contract for the first time would want to assure some minimal bundle of rights for themselves. Um, okay, but and I, I've just put up a handout uh, describing some of the developments in social contract theory and some of the sources that Nussbaum is using, um, some of the figures, some of the basic philosophical concepts that get us from Locke to Nussbaum, I guess. Um, Marx is definitely an enemy of classical liberalism. We saw that as well. Okay. Um, so, in a way, we only got the first little bit of the history of classical liberalism in Locke. And actually, Locke's version of contractarian liberalism is not uh, Nussbaum's primary source. Uh, I would say that um, her version of classical liberalism is almost pure Immanuel Kant, who's someone who does appear in our textbook, but which, which we didn't, whom we didn't study. Um, so, I mean, but, the, you know, there's a reason why the Locke's position and Kant's position could be called by the same name. Uh, and also John Stuart Mill's position uh, as a utilitarian. All these words are, uh, I, I try to define them in the handout and stuff, so check it out, please. Um, so actually, these people come from very different philosophical traditions and orientations. They disagree about virtually everything, Locke, Kant, and Mill, but from quite different uh, philosophical orientations, they draw very similar political conclusions. Um, the emphasis on individual rights uh, and human dignity, universal human rights. Uh, I mean, I define classical liberalism out of Locke in terms of social contract theory, individual natural or God-given rights, uh, and the rule of law. But again, that's those things are not necessarily Nussbaum's emphasis, although those are all things that she uh, would endorse, probably ex with the possible exception of contract theory. I'm not sure exactly what she says about contract theory. But anyway, uh, so this is how she describes classical liberalism. Uh, it's really worth looking at this. Um, and like I say, the basic source of this is Immanuel Kant. Um, she says this on page 1029. At the heart of this tradition, classical liberalism, is a twofold intuition about human beings. Um, namely, that all, just by being human, are of equal dignity and worth, no matter where they are situated in society, and that the prime, like whatever class they're in, whatever their race, whatever their gender, they're of equal dignity and worth. Those are Kantian phrases, not necessarily Locke, uh, Locke's basic moral categories. Um, so everyone should be regarded as having equal dignity. That is, everyone should be treated with equal respect in some sense, as a moral agent, as something who counts 
morally the same as every other person. It's not to say that people are equal in their abilities or equal in their situations or etc. Uh, or even equal in their moral uh, worth or whatever, you know, uh, in terms of what crimes they committed or something like that. You know, some people are innocent, some people guilty. But each person has a fundamental dignity as a human being. And for Kant and for Nussbaum and for many, many other philosophers, this is, uh, maybe for Aristotle, um, this rests on our status as rational creatures, as people, as things that are capable of projecting goals or goods that we want and of pursuing intentional projects, to de of defining our own good and of pursuing it rationally. That's the basic idea of what a human being is in Kant uh, and in Nussbaum and what gives us our value. I just want to just mark for a second, I'm not sure how rational we are. I'm not sure this isn't a little self-deluded, but anyway, whatever. Um, okay, at the heart of this tradition is a twofold intuition about human beings, namely that all, just by being human, are of equal dignity and worth, no matter where they are situated in society, and that the primary source of this worth is a power of moral choice within them, the power to rationally deliberate about ends or goods a power that consists in their ability to plan a life in accordance with one's own evaluation of ends. To these two intuitions, um, which link liberalism uh, to Greek thought, she says, the liberal tradition adds one more, that the moral equality of persons gives them a fair claim to certain types of treatment at the hands of society. Um, that is, you know, dignity is just not just an abstract thing that somebody has. It's a claim to be treated with respect, including by the authorities of one's own society. Uh, so it suggests a kind of limited sovereignty or even a democratic politics. Um, so that's, I mean, that's somewhat different than when I characterize classical liberalism out of Locke. Uh, but I don't think these things are incompatible with each other either. And the fundamental value of persons, each person having the same individual rights, right? Not collective rights, not group rights, but individual rights as a rational agent. That picture, you know, is certainly compatible with Locke, if nothing else, uh, even if he doesn't get into uh, classical liberalism by that particular argumentative um, root, All right? Uh, or she, and she also, I would say, um, she characterizes classical liberalism negatively. Uh, that is what it is not. And that's, a, that, that's useful too. So I'll just read this from the top of uh, 1030, what liberalism is opposed to. Liberalism is opposed, first of all, to any approach to politics that turns morally, morally irrelevant differences into systematic sources of social hierarchy. And morally relevant differences, irrelevant differences would be things like race and gender and sexual orientation. Uh, okay. Um, so turning those things into systematic sources of hierarchy uh, is just directly opposed to classical liberalism, right? It's an egalitarian politics in that sense. Um, it is opposed then to the naturalizing of hierarchies, like saying like, you know, women are naturally or biologically subordinate to men or whatever, evolutionarily selected for that or whatever the old stories of, of underpinning sexism uh, were, naturalizing the hierarchies, making them biological or not a matter of human decision or choice, not a matter susceptible to political transformation because natural or biological racial hierarchies have been conceived that way. Of course, gender hierarchies as well. Um, even the idea that homosexuality is unnatural, okay, is an example of this, like naturalizing 
a straight gay hierarchy because y'all are unnatural, allegedly. Um, okay, to feudalism and hereditary monarchy, the, these are things that the liberalism opposes, to the caste system characteristics of, characteristic of traditional Indian society, to related caste hierarchies created in many times and places by differences of race and class and power and religion. It is opposed, second, to forms of political organization that are corporatist or organically organized. And now this is an aspect of the individualism of Nussbaum's classical liberalism or of the classical liberal tradition. Um, we don't conceive of the political collective or the nation or whatever it may be as a um, organic whole, like a creature, like an individual. We've seen many people who do exactly that. Uh, okay, so for, you know, um, uh, that, you know, the a political system makes us a single individual in some sense, a collective individual. Uh, even some versions of classical liberalism have that going on, actually. Um, that so that the ultimate individual, the ultimate re political reality has to be the individual ultimately. Um, that seek we're opposed to uh, political views that seek a good for the group as a whole, without focusing above all on the well-being and agency of the individual group members, the initiative of the individual group members there, and also their rational dignity. Finally, it is opposed to a politics that is ideologically based in the sense that it turns one particular conception of value, whether utopian or religious or traditional, um, into a mandatory standard imposed by authority on all citizens. So the utopian standpoint might be like even a Marxist or I mean, Marx would certainly deny the charge of being a utopian, but, um, you know, a, a particular conception of value that will be imposed on the entire society. Um, each citizen in this classical liberal view defines their own good, is an independent uh, locus of value. And so a society that crushes that because for re conservative reasons, because that's not our tradition or whatever, or for radical leftist reasons, for example, where we're going to revolution, we're going to have a revolution and transform the entire society. Uh, okay. E either way, um, that's opposed to the value, ultimate value that, classical liberalism in Nussbaum's version places on individual freedoms and the in individual rational agency. Um, religious intolerance, the establishment of single church or the establishment of a single utopian political vision of the good, all these strike the liberal as embodying unequal respect for persons. And maybe that's the bottom line of this mountain's classical liberalism, equal respect for persons who ought to be free to follow their conscience in the most important matters. Okay, you, you might think about uh, coronavirus, for example, though, the situation. Uh, am I free to follow my conscience to go protest at the state capitol in Harrisburg uh, against uh, distancing regulations or whatever? Um, and isn't it a vi violation of my autonomy if you restrict me from doing that? And on what grounds can a classical liberal uh, endorse that? Well, if you're, I, I think if you're John Stuart Mill, you're probably okay because you're a t utilitarian and non-distancing is liable to have disastrous results on people's happiness. Again, look at the handout with a little bit of utilitarianism and stuff. All right. Now, there have been uh, many trenchant critiques of that position of classical liberalism uh, or classical liberal style politics by feminists. Um, 
and like I said, we saw some of this in Held, but she has a number of figures in mind. Uh, you know, she quotes them, Alison Jagger, for instance. Uh, if you were really concerned too, you could probably find the sources on this uh, and look up these criticisms. Um, okay, so there are three primary uh, criticisms that feminists have made uh, about classical liberalism. Um, according to Nussbaum, and that she is concerned to answer. The first is that it's excessively individualistic. That's a, Held certainly said that straightforwardly. Uh, and actually Marx had a version of that criticism. Um, that it's too abstract and general. For example, in the considering all people to be fundamentally the same, uh, because when you boil it all down, it's rational agency, and we each have it, uh, is abstracting from all, seemingly abstracting from all the concrete conditions of human life, uh, the actual family relationships, the actual traditions of a culture that you find yourself in. It treats human beings as a kind of generalized abstraction. All of us the same, Okay, but all of us are only the same in a kind of, at a very abstract level in which we're all members of the same species or whatever, or something like that. Uh, or that we all have this kind of rational dignity, allegedly. Um, okay, whereas feminists and held, it gives some indication of this as well, uh, hold that human life is always in the middle of a culture, in the middle of a set of traditions, in the middle of a complex thicket of relationships, right? and that you blank all that out to just treat people as kind of these, uh, you know, as, as a general something or other, a, a, just a rational agent, or whatever. Uh, and that this kind of erases, for example, the lives of women or the concrete situations of the lives of women, or, I mean, Marx might say, the concrete situations of the lives of the proletariat, for instance, the actual concrete economic relationships that are going on. You see, it's one thing to say, like, everyone has equal dignity, that's all very nice. But how are the conditions of production actually affecting the dignity that people experience, or even the dignity that they take themselves to have? Like for that, we have to get into concrete considerations of the culture or sociology and so on. Um, so that's the second criticism. And then the third uh, is that the kind of enlightenment classical liberal tradition is too rationalistic. I mean, you've heard already the kind of relentless emphasis on the idea of rational agency and the idea that that's what gives us value, right? So to be irrational on this view would be to be inhuman, right? I, I'm, I'm just going to say like this, this runs through the whole of contemporary philosophy, this idea that we are fundamentally rational agents and stuff like this. Sometimes I wonder whether philosophers have met any human beings. Okay. But anyway, um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that right here. Um, but yeah, that, that's a two, it portrays human beings as reasoning machines or something like that, like practical reasoning machines. Like I want X, you know, doing action A will help me get X. So I do action A. Aristotle's practical syllogism. All right. Um, I mean, we could wonder whether that is really the way we come to act or not. But, uh, and some of these feminists are wondering that, I guess, among other things. Uh, so it's an, ex it's an aridly reason-based picture of what a human being is. Or maybe it pictures human beings as though they were Vulcans, you know, uh, logicians or something. And then suspiciously might stop uh, counting them as human if they fail at that or something like that. Um, all right, so these are substantive criticisms. And, you know, held is just one version of this. And it, there's a whole tradition of feminist-style criticisms of classical liberalism. Um, I mean, for one thing, 
if you know the United States is a classical liberal polity, you know it's fundamentally directly based on the thought of John Locke. All right. Well, how has the gender, how have gender, how's gender played through the history of the United States? All right. So you're you're talking equality. You have all these abstract, nice little principles. Uh, you know, how does that engage concrete people's lives? All right. Now, Nussbaum says, uh, the basic argument in Nussbaum is that classical liberalism is a, or perhaps the, uh, is a good or even the best um, basic political orientation for feminists to take up and essential in certain ways to articulating important feminist insights. Um, so she's what we would call a liberal feminist. And radical feminists get, would get all uh, ticked off about this, uh, I suppose. But, all right. Um, so as she says, uh, this on page um, 1031, at the beginning of the individual and community section, the most common feminist charge against, against liberalism is that it is too individualistic. And again, remember what Marx says about individualism as well that it's a capitalist ideology. Uh, by taking the individual to be the basic unit for political thought, it treats the individual as classical liberalism treats the individual as prior to society, as capable in theory as if not in fact of existing without it. Um, okay. Um, Al she quotes Alison Jagger, a uh, feminist political philosopher. Um, just continuing the same paragraph, Jagger lately restates, later restates this liberal metaphysical assumption in an even stronger form. Each, quote, each human individual has desires, interests, etc., that in principle can be fulfilled quite separately from the desires and interests of other people. Um, Jagger later describes this as a liberal assumption of political solipsism, like that only I exist, only I count. Um, the assumption that human individuals are essentially self-sufficient entities. Nussbaum continues, described in this way, liberal individualism lies perilously close to two positions most feminists agree in rejecting, egoism and normative self-sufficiency. And we did talk about egoism and psychological egoism and ethical e egoism earlier. Um, Okay, or the ideal that people, each person should be self-sufficient. I think of Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, or Thoreau uh, in Walden or something like this, like picturing, trying to make themselves self-sufficient or something like that, or treat themselves as though they were self-sufficient. And, you know, Jagger is probably going to say, like, no human being is self-sufficient, nor is that a worthy ideal. We should be mutually dependent or, you know, mutually supportive and stuff like this. Um, now, um, for, I mean, one thing she says is that actually classical liberals are not egoists in this line, much less solipsists or whatever, and that there's plenty of room in classical liberalism uh, for social cohesion, though it's going to come down to the decision of individual people to cooperate, right? But the centrality of social life, you know, is recapturable, is capturable within classical liberalism in certain ways, at least, right? Even if it makes the individual fund, uh, fundamental, according to Nussbaum. Um, but then she says, this is quite interesting. We should note, this is on 1032, right-hand column at the top, First, we should note that the normative goal of self-sufficiency is not one that feminists should dismiss without argument. The figures in the Western philosophical tradition who have defended some of some form of detachment, detachment and self-sufficiency as goals, in particular the Stoics and Spinoza, don't worry about that right now, have done so have done so using powerful arguments, in particular arguments that connect the aim of self-sufficiency with the elimination of anger and revenge and the creation of a just and merciful society. So one thing that she points out just straight up 
is that one problem that women have had in patriarchy is that they are dependent on men. And this makes them subordinate to men. You know, if you have the classic sort of nuclear family with the man as the breadwinner or whatever, I, the woman is just in a straight up economically subordinate position. Many people, including, you know, if you care about someone who's uh, in a marriage like that, let's say, or is a homemaker, uh, I mean, at least like uh, women of my mother's generation would tell some uh, woman who's about to get married, make sure you've got your own money. Right? You don't want to be dependent, totally dependent on this man. Okay? Um, and, then if, and then in terms of like restrictions, if women are restricted from the workplace, uh, that's going to make them poorer and it's going to make them less independent, less free. And that whole situation is structural sexist oppression. Um, so many feminists have insisted on the self-sufficiency or uh, encouraged all sorts of uh, procedures for self-reliance among women. And so Nussbaum also argues that part of sexist ideology is, is to say that women are dependent and social in a way that men aren't. Okay? And maybe even to conclude from that, that they don't need the same sort of individual rights that men do or something like that. So, um, you know, the fact that we're all connected as held, uh, uh, has held held, um, and that maybe women are more thought of as more nurturingly connected and interconnected within family life, for example. Nussbaum is going to say that that's all a set of sexist cliches that has kept women, you know, bound to these domestic tasks and so on. I mean, Held is aware of some of these problems, but still, if you're saying like um, the model is the mother-child relationship, and it's involuntary and stuff like this. Well, the mother-child relationship has also been a site, a basic site of sexist oppression. Like you should be home taking care of the kids, right? Instead of out there in the world trying to change something or trying to, you know, uh, achieve your own goods as you understand them, if those goods are not just parenting, successful parenting, which is a legitimate good, of course. Um, so the idea that, a, that, say, a woman can't even fundamentally distinguish herself from the other members of her family and held gets close to that kind of thing. Okay, that's all about structural oppression, all right? Women, uh, at least at a certain point in history, are going to need to come up with their own initiative. They're going to need to self, they're going to need to respect themselves as autonomous, rational agents. And many or most feminists have uh, held that to be important, at least right up until like the 90s or 80s and 90s. Um, so she's what she's saying is like feminists need individualism. If you think, I mean, if you start with a view that every person has the same dignity, that's a good place to start out for gender equality, right? And racial equality, uh, Nussbaum is arguing. Right? Whatever the problems might be in proving that or, you know, or rationally justifying it, um, you know, it's, it's certainly a potentially liberating ideology for oppressed groups. And for example, 19th century feminism emphasized it relentlessly. Like what's wrong with patriarchy? According to, say, Margaret Fuller, the American, uh, great American feminist, wrote, uh, author of Woman in the 19th Century, it's that it massively violates the autonomy, the dignity, and the individual rights of women, right? Uh, their, you know, their ability to decide the direction of their own lives, their ability to control their own resources, and so on. Like, those are individual rights. Right? Their, their uh, ability to express themselves straightforwardly in public space.
or advocate their own causes. Right? So she thinks classical liberalism is a reasonable uh, ideology to underpin feminism. And it's, it is, at least regard, with regard to certain kinds of feminism. I think she's right about that. Um, I mean, just to give you a little flavor of this, uh, 1034, put this way, in, liberal individualism seems to be a good view for feminists to embrace, for it is clear that women have too rarely been treated as ends in themselves. That's a Kantian formulation for respecting the di human dignity of another person. Treat them as an end in themselves, not as a means to some other end. And too frequently, women have been treated, says Nussbaum, as the ends, uh, as means to the ends of others. So what, right there, she's arguing, though she's not quite saying, that a Kantian uh, picture of moral dignity um, is a uh, is you know essential to a kind of feminist critique of patriarchy. Um, that what's wrong with patriarchy partly is that it treats women as mere means to achieve certain goals, like child rearing, for instance. Um, women have often been treated as part of a larger unit, especially the family, and valued primarily for their contribution as reproducers and caregivers rather than as sources of agency and worth in their own right. All right. Um, so I, I guess I'll try to wind this up fairly quickly. Uh, the charge of excessive abstraction. Um, okay. Now, one thing she raises in that section is uh, the political philosophy known as communitarianism. Uh, and you can see the handout on late 20th century theories of justice on that. Um, so if we treat people as emerging, you know, as th thickly emerging in a cultural tradition, rather than as abstract moral agents who are all fundamentally the same in some sense, um, which is what's recommended by communitarianism. I talked about this with Held, and uh, by a Held version of um, uh, feminism. That is, we've got to pay attention to the actual situation of the whole culture, the, the way this thing merges out of traditions and stuff like that, and we need to uh, respect that. Uh, we need to move from that, you know, nudge that in the direct, in a just direction rather than transform it utterly or something like that. Respect the traditions, respect family structures, respect, you know, like, in other words, we're not going to be able to do political philosophy without engaging the real details of existing cultures. I mean, just to, you should look at the section more carefully, but just to preview the problem of, uh, with this that Nussbaum identifies. Well, these structures that we're respecting, including the structures that held ho holds in such esteem, like the nuclear family, actually, uh, or like the mother-child relationship, uh, have been profoundly oppressive. Okay, And, we, you know, these communitarian-style feminisms and other, and conservatism's, uh, don't provide a reasonable way to th critique the existing society, including its gender relations, but in all sorts of ways. Uh, but this abstract, uh, admittedly sort of abstract general framework of human dignity and rights and freedoms, okay, uh, and purposes and all, does do that. It pr provides a standpoint from which to critique the existing traditional practices of the culture, including things like family structures. Um, and then finally, uh, the excessive, the allegedly excessive emphasis on reason. Um, she's, uh, Nussbaum says, liberalism traditionally holds that human beings are above all reasoning beings. That's, that's fundamental to our dignity in that Kantian framework. Um, which has been incredibly influential. Um, and the dignity of reason is the primary source of human equality. 
I think there are many problems with that. But anyway, uh, as Jagger puts it, liberal political theory is grounded on the conception of human beings as essentially rational agents. Right? So where's the room for emotion? And Held makes exactly this criticism of classical liberalism. Um, you know, we are not just reasoning machines. And, you know, the claim that we are is kind of, uh, uh, is male chauvinist, let's say. It's this kind of male fantasy of what a human being should be. Uh, but women know that human beings are nurturers, that human beings are fundamentally interdependent and connected, all right? Um, and a feminist critique could have more affective, more emotional, more passionate content in politics than simply reasoning your way, uh, you know, like uh, lionizing reason as the human, uh, distinctively human faculty. And then making that the entire basis of a human culture, as if that were possible for emotional, passionate creatures like us. Um, so the idea is like, when we see this from a woman's point of view, a la held, we could reconceive emotion and passion as central to human relationships and hence to human politics. Um, now, uh, Nussbaum gives a, a kind of classical, classical liberal uh, response to that, which is, the mother-child relationship is great, okay? But you better think about that, right? Don't just feel, think. Okay, go ahead and feel, all right? But think about your feelings and the political ramifications of your, and sources of your feelings. Okay? Uh, don't just accept the traditions of your culture, obviously. If you do, that's not gonna be compatible with any kind of feminism. Um, or just like, don't stop thinking, she says. And she answers this uh, one particularly um, um, extreme feminist view on this uh, by someone named Nodding, but I don't think we need to worry about that too much. Uh, she says this, and we could think about this in relation to Held. Even were, this is uh, uh, 1044, even were symbiotic fused caring a good thing in the mother-child relationship. That's what, you know, symbiotic fused caring is a pretty interesting phrase for what Held is talking about. A very different sort of care seems required in political life. Here, indiscriminate self-giving away, as in the mother-child relationship perhaps, uh, seems a very bad idea, especially for women who have frequently been brought up to think that they should sacrifice their well-being to others without demanding anything for themselves. This has frequently served male interests and harmed women. A little reflection, rational reflection, far from representing one thought too many, might provide the saving distance between social norms and one's own selfhood. So you you need to rationally ponder the social norms that are uh, in play, even in the mother-child relationship, okay? Which is not some kind of purely natural thing. It's a politically situated thing. Um, so it's good to feel, but think too, okay? Or you're going to lose yourself and add to the destructive, oppressive structure of patriarchy, she thinks. Um, okay, um, she says, what liberalism asks is that a woman distinguish her own well-being from the well-being of others, and Held doesn't think so, uh, I think. Noticing, like, care ethics and care politics ask you to de-distinguish your own interests from the interests of others. Um, Noticing what tensions might exist between the two, even if they are bound up with one another, okay? So what tensions might exist between my political ideals, for example, and the mothering situation that I'm in? How did this model of mothering arise? And do we really want to take that rather problematic modeling of mo uh, model of mothering uh, as a political ideal? Right? Um, 
So I'll just maybe I'll just finish off with like her praise, like her encomium to classical liberalism. I should do another lecture where I kind of attack this, but anyway, uh, this is on 1046, right hand column. Two things fill the mind with ever increasing awe, wrote Kant the starry sky above me and the moral law within me. In that famous statement, we see the radical vision of liberalism. Think what real people usually hold in awe. Money, power, success, nice clothes, fancy cars, the dignity of kings, the wealth of corporations, the authority of despots of all sorts, and perhaps most important of all, the authority of custom and tradition. Think what real women frequently hold in awe, or at least in fear, the physical power of men, the authority of men in the workplace, the sexual allure of male power, the alleged maleness of the deity, the control men, males have over work and shelter and food. The liberal holds none of these things in awe. She feels reverence for the world, its mystery and wonder, and she reveres the capacity of persons, each person, to choose and fashion a life. All right, so that's a nice, uh, nice little inspiring uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, and I, I would say it's, it's quite a compelling defense in, in a number of ways, even though problems may arise. All right, I'll be in touch. I guess we have one more reading left. Patricia Williams from The Alchemy of Race and Rights.